leader North Central is as much as we always do Uhuru for them when it comes to politics, it is they are the Middle East of Nigeria. When you speak about Benue, Kogi, Niger, I believe Nasara, the value in their soil, it's unbelievable according to many. So why are we not tapping the potential? I think another aspect people forget is their types of agriculture and farming, the subsistence one that many do, and then the one that is capital intensive and requires investment, clear policies by the federal government, and so forth. And I guess this is where Honorable Mike Day comes in. I was in trouble a few weeks ago, but I'm used to it. But I'll go ahead and say I fully support what Honorable Mike Day said. If I am to give one away, if there's a clear plan, I don't see why NYSC should not be taken out to invest in agriculture. We have to do it. It's an opportunity for employment. And this employment cannot see the insecurity we have from banditry and our young people finding banditry and kidnapping as something very sexy. So for me, it is all intertwined before we get to the forest aspect, which is what I believe I can speak on in my little nine-month experience as chairman banking. Um, the CBN, <laughs> Senator Ali's idea, I know that before I became a rep member, I was senior legislative aide and chief of staff to my mentor, the incumbent governor of Kaduna State, Senator Obasai. And he was the chairman of the committee on banking and other financial institutions in the Ninth Senate. So we related very closely with the immediately led CBN um, during the Buari administration. Now, it's not like me to speak on facts that I do not have. I've been a victim of that. I'm not calling our Ebo Ayub because if I do, he'll slap me on the way out. He does that. Um, let's just say as things stand, record about the previous central bank is not in good light. When history tends to change, I'm not saying it will low, sir. I'm saying, I remember when my father was minister at FC, his record was not in good light. But now, he gets free meals in chopsticks and many restaurants in Abuja. I doubt it will happen with CBN. A lot that was wrong got wrong. And we are partly responsible. By we, I mean my primary base, the National Assembly. Our duties essentially are to oversight, pass laws, and follow your money. We have the power of the purse. And for reasons that, with my little knowledge, I won't divulge here, I'm sure the Honorable Minister understands, I think we allowed CBN too much independence back then. The irony is, life happens, Barista trained me, I become a rep member. High level politics is done. Without banking background, I find myself chairing the Banking Regulation Committee. Some will say Nigeria, some will say corruption, that's your problem. It's what I end up doing with it that matters to me. Now, in the House, leader, there are three committees, actually four committees on banking now. Unlike the Senate, that still has the Senate Committee on bank, on banking regulation. Yes, and other financial institutions. Thank you, sir. In the Senate, in the House now, we have banking and digital economy. I guess it was designed to capture the whole um, aura with crypto and um, how technology plays a key role in the financial markets now. The second is banking and the other ancillary institutions. That banking committee is meant to oversight the DFIDs and so forth. The third is banking insurance, chaired by a very, very experienced member, Honorable Jaha Babau, and that oversights NDIC. And then they gave uh, skinny, small B banking regulation, which has the central bank. So that is why, even though I'm a small boy, some people, not leader, of course, he remembers me, bumpers treat me like a big boy because of CBN. But it's not the CBN of before. Now, why? I think President Ashwa Jubola and Tinubu must be commended for appointing the current central bank governor 
Mr. Olaemi Cardoso. He is an upright man. He is a no-nonsense man. He takes public service for what it should be, an opportunity to serve and leave an impact that your future generations will be proud of. I've had the opportunity to relate to him along with the chairman of the banking committee in the Senate Bureau. And I am proud to work closely with him. Now, that is interesting because what I've been given CBN so far is the same independence that the previous committee gave them. I am gambling and hoping, not hoping, I do my research well, very well, and I've heard about his record in public service. He has briefed us in private about what he hopes for CBN, and I fundamentally believe in it. My Ebon, are you touched on that? In around the world, federal reserves and central banks have clear rules. And those rules are controlling money supply, curbing inflation, and supervising and regulating the banking sector. There might be exceptional circumstances where they have to do interventions. But that is not their primary duty. It is not their area of strength. It's like giving me an aeroplane to land. There will be dire consequences. But in this country, we've made it OK to take people and put them in roles they are not designed for. Now, sometimes it works out fine. you know. But I honestly believe if I didn't go through the UIF and Barista is my old school of thought and some experience learning from the likes of the Honorable Minister and my boss in the Senate, I wouldn't be doing an OK job right now as a rep member. I, I know some of you are wondering if I'm doing an OK job. I'm not just on Twitter calling out obedience. If you check, I am actually doing my best to represent my people. But experience matters. Now, just yesterday, the Central Bank finally announced that they've cleared the forex backlog that they inherited. That is serious work. About $7 billion was cleared. For me, as chairman banking, and I have 46 members with me, and they're all older than me, they are used to call CBN. Let's pressure them. Uh, let's do this, that. I will not do that. If the EME Cardoso will let CBN government goes astray, I could use our constitutional functions to engage with them. I believe in the Telugu administration, as well as I believe in the Buhari administration. I am APC to the bone, and I am proud of this government, and I am not going to cause controversy and challenge them at their jobs when I know they are better than, at it than I am as chairman banking. We will keep an eye on them, but when they succeed, we will toot their horns as they've been doing now. Just recently, the CBN, in line with taking a new direction, donated a ton of fertilizer to the Ministry of Agriculture. Um, they, the ministry, the Honorable Minister, has an entire department and a team that could coordinate this um, distribution. How can CBN do that efficiently? That is not their job. The staff are not trained to do that. The directors are not trained to do that. So I commend Yanni Cardoso for doing just that. I was going to answer that leader. The fertilizer came from previous interventions. This is it. We had Agnes. Ebon Ayub was in Nirsal when I was working with Senator Obasanya as chairman banking committee. I think he could speak a lot about the errors that occurred in Nirsal. There's no issue with interventions. I did one yesterday, even though that's not my job. I do interventions in scholarships. I do a computer conditional cash transfer across the wards. I represent mostly to women. But you have to have correct data to do it. You have to know how to do it. If not, Corruption will prevail, sir. This is exactly what happened. So I know we are not used to this. I can say some things that I won't even say right now about M form M forms, round tripping. Whenever you set up a policy and you do not keep an eye on it, we are human beings. We will abuse it, sir. 
So for now, my committee has taken a position, and it's cost me a lot of political will. But I believe at the end of the day, history will vindicate me, and maybe I'll score good points with the likes of Honorable Minister and Ashwaju for defending the central bank governor. Because so far, I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, um, it's as if, if the federal government, and we're waiting for an appointment by the grace of God, if the federal government had appointed you as a deputy, di di deputy, di deputy governor in CBN, I will have faith in what you are capable of. The likes of Dr. Balabello, the deputy governor of corporate services, is experienced. He came from Nexim Bank, where my older sister emerged from. I don't need to commend Mohammed Sani the Tiju. I'm obviously biased. He was my father's chief of staff. But, you know, I think Ashwaju has gotten this right with the CBN governor. We have not been able to intimidate him. He is focused. He knows what he wants to do. And I am looking forward to partnering with them to pass progressive legislation. We are working on amending the CBN Act. It's not been amended completely since 91. We passed the Banking and Other Financial Institutions Act. My boss sponsored that, and President Buhari graciously assented to it. But uh, we are open to ideas, please, if there are economic and financial experts here. My background is not that. I'm playing catch up. But this is the issue, sir. Now, to connect and to conclude, The most important bill that I intend to push, and I'm glad Dr. Stella is here, is on factoring. Next time you capitalized and you sat with your MD a few weeks ago before I signed your budget, which we did, along with the Senate chairman, we have to recapitalize next time, set it up in a sort of format like BOI, because if our farmers are not exporting these products, then we're not playing the game big time. It's that simple. You know, I don't believe, I think Nigeria, like China, has a population to produce and consume its own. But you want Forex coming into this country, as Honorable Martin Bay said, when we had the groundnut pyramids, when we had the cocoa plants, it's to start exporting. Now, there are issues with export, and I know Dr. Sell is doing an excellent job there with the team. That there's too much bureaucracy and bottlenecks. Please and please, next thing is under the committee I oversight. If you have any ideas on how to cut through that red tape, I'm willing to cause trouble to do that. Because there are a lot of farmers that would love to export. We have ginger in Kaduna. But what stops them from engaging is the difficulty to actually go through the export process, get licenses, and so forth. So that is what I would say about that. Um, as I said, I'm sorry if I was not articulate enough. This is not my area of expertise. But I'll play catch up. And hopefully, when my leader is doing the 45th colloquium, I could be quoting percentages and banking policies like Ebon Ayu. He has experience of 15 years in GT. I'm only 36. Thank you very much. And it was a pleasure. Yes. Oh, uh, yeah, oh, 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 that's an interesting question. I, I actually, for a while, thought the dollar was um, was overvalued. I thought, um, honestly, but you know how Nigerians, you see them online, no, Nigeria is a rich country. So no, we're not. We're not a rich country. We're potentially rich. But when you come to, sorry, leader, your state and my state, and you have one security guard with four wives, and 48 children, you can't say we're rich because we are overpopulated, we don't produce enough. Now, to answer the question, I thought, you know, and I'm curious what other people think, including the minister. He sits in fact, I'm sure they have um, more ideas. I actually used to disagree with Ebon Ayub, but I don't anymore because I see it coming down. But I used to think, my, my position is, what do we produce? Not much. What do we export? Not much. So why are Nigerians under the assumption that our currency is strong? That was my position. We don't, you know, our trade volume isn't that great. You know, some position. Engaging one another to think about our country because we feel we have a duty to do so. 
Before I go into the main chart, <clears throat> let me say that some of the issues being raised here are very important. And I know you are having three plank of issues here. And obviously they have a nexus. But is the nexus in a hierarchical manner, top down or bottom up or tangentially, I think is a matter of debate. But let me say one thing. In all of this, one group that I know stands at the bay sustainably is the farmer. And from that argument, you can say that when the farmer does well, food prices can be managed. Doing well here means producing maximally to the highest productivity possible. But a situation where a farmer in Nigeria is getting 1.5 tons per hectare or 2 tons per hectare, and other people are getting 9 tons per hectare, 10 tons per hectare, I don't see the competition here. It's not comparable. <coughs> Excuse me. A situation where our dairy farmers are getting 2 point something liters or 1.7 liters per cow and somebody is getting 20 liters. Is it comparable? So that's why I said for the farmer, the farmer is key. Now, you see, unfortunately, when things are said from the Western perspective, we see it as fashionable, we see it as trendy, but when we come back here, we look at it from a derogatory perspective, unfortunately. A farmer is a farmer anywhere in the world. The U.S. farmer is proud to be a U.S. farmer. The Brazilian farmer is proud to be a Brazilian farmer. In the Western world, farmers are proud to be farmers. But here, we all see farmers from a derogatory perspective. And I think I would I recall somebody, whether it is Mr. Rexon, who said people see farming as punishment. Or is it you? All right. Well, these are part of the issues. And I think for this conversation, <coughs> I would like to say until and unless we go back to the basics, we're deceiving ourselves. You can do all the lies, do all the dancing, do everything. At the end of the day, the reality is waiting for you. And like Alex Haley said, deal with the reality or the reality will deal with you. We refuse to deal with the reality and today reality is dealing with us. To an extent, those who say there is food, all right. Has anybody ever gone to the market and you are not able to see the food item you want to buy? Has anybody? So we are not in that crisis point. But the issue we are dealing with here is that the purchasing power of people has been eroded. And so ability to buy that affordability is the issue. And so when you talk about food security, you are talking about some indices. First, you are talking about availability. You are talking about accessibility. You are talking about affordability. And you are also talking about in the right nutritional content on a sustainable basis. So if you go to an Owambe party by Farmer Rex, and he declares abundance of food and you eat you and have your feed. And the next day you wake up, there is nothing to eat. Can we say you are food secure? You are not food secure. But for you to get up every day and be able to eat without you know, having any problem is the issue. And I think, like President Bola Hametinubu said, no Nigerian should go to bed hungry. 
he believes the state has a duty to ensure that food is not just available, but is accessible and is affordable. That is a duty. And if you take it from the perspective of the Constitution, it says the primary purpose of governance is the welfare and security of the citizens. And so when you take that, what is welfare? A man who is hungry, definitely his welfare is in question. So when you talk about welfare, I think the key issue here is actually talking about food. And I recall in the night assembly, we actually had some amendments that of the Constitution to bring back the idea around food security as a front burner issue for governance. And President Bola Metinibu did right when he changed the name of the Ministry for Rural Development to Federal Minister of Agriculture and Food Security to underscore the importance of food security in what we should be doing. Now, the other aspect is that Yes, a lot has happened, and a lot to continue to happen for good, because we are changing trajectory, we are changing direction, and the imperative of this government in this direction I will highlight shortly. But let me say very quickly, when you talk about Forex, I love the idea my brother here brought about the simple economics of demand and supply. But I think we are not giving the complete story. In our days as children, as teenagers, in the 70s, 80s, or 60s, when we were talking about this boom, we need to ask some questions. What was the nature of our consumption? And I think to that extent, you know, horrible uh, quotidian actually highlighted some of those things. A situation where, in those days, there are so many things we don't import, and they were all manufactured in country here. When you look at car, we are having manufacturing plants, isn't it? Civil servants, we are giving car loans. You want to take a B two? You take a bit. Hmm? You want to take a pujo, you take a pujo. And so on and so forth. And if you look at it also that time, your brake pad was produced here in Nigeria. Your battery, I remember, is it the exact battery produced in Ibada? Brake pad produced somewhere in the, in, the, in the east? You can go on and on and on. I remember when Nigeria entered recession, sometimes in 2016, and another one in 2018, or thereabout, we had a very massive debate in the Senate, and these are some of the issues we looked at. In the course of that work, we had cause to go back to say, okay, how come we've not developed a list of items that we should do an assessment to say, no, these items, we need to now start ramping up their production in country. Toothpick. Toothpick. Whether the plastic one or the wood one, where is it produced in Nigeria? So, those are the questions. And I think, going forward, we need to begin to look at these issues very seriously. And I'm happy with the proposition that it's time for Nigerians to begin to think about special purpose vehicles for tapping the opportunities that are available. If this will be the only takeaway from this very important gathering today, I want to say congratulations to you for making that possible. Now, let me just take one or two things because a number of things were said and I made some very copious notes. But suffice it to go back to the farmer who is my boss and the reason for which my ministry exists. I respect all the points you've mentioned and I want to tell you 
that in the Federal Ministry of Agriculture and Food Security, as it is today, all the issues you have raised are already in our kit, receiving attention. In fact, it is for honoring him that I'm here. I was actually involved in a retreat with some staff to really work out the work plan for this year's 2024 appropriation to make sure that the work plan aligns with our presidential priorities, which we signed a bond with President Bola Nechinubu. But I also equally respect the fact that when young minds are discussing about the same country, it's important that we create time. That's why I had to jettison that to be here. If I leave here, I'm not going back to the office. I'm going back to that venue. But you know, when you are not on seat, other people will want to, even if you give them work, they'll use that opportunity too. But I want to say this. We realized when we came on board, there's a lot of problem on ground. And one of the issues I think different speakers here have talked about is, who are Nigerian farmers? Who is the farmer? He has pointed out some things here. As his own effort, at his own level. But should he be drinking Panadol for everybody who has a headache? I don't, I don't think he should. But what we need is a system where everybody is certain. Everybody has some degree of confidence in terms of the integrity of that system that this will happen will not happen. Unfortunately, some of the programs being mentioned, while I would not want to go into too much details about it, as a citizen, I knew where they got it right also. It was a good policy intention. But good policy intentions do not implement themselves, do not execute themselves. What ought to have happened was when you have that, then you identify your best food and put them forward. Get your best soldiers at all times to put them forward. In the course of implementation, there are institutions, existing institutions that were weakened by the intervention at that level. And I think that is the realization that the current you know, administration realized. And that's why the governor quickly said, we need to disengage from these direct interventions. Let's rather strengthen the institutions of government that are saddled with the responsibility that we thought should be enhanced. At any rate, the Bank of Agriculture you talked about has not been capitalized over the years. Yet, the CBM, for example, is a part owner. But they did not capitalize it. So, but I want to give you the good news. The good news here is Realizing this reality, the Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, His Excellency Senator Kashi Shakima, is leading a current effort along with the Coordinating Minister of the Economy and other critical stakeholders to reform the Bank of Agriculture. And the reform needed in the Bank of Agriculture, with due respect to all the suggestions, is not about name change is about the content of the bank and what the bank ought to do. The bank's name has changed almost three times. If you don't know, it used to be uh, Nigeria Agricultural Bank. Then it became Nigeria Agricultural and Cooperative Bank. Then it became another one before this particular re re you know, reform was done to Bank of Agriculture. And the assets they have is massive. They are located until now in each and every 774 local government they have an office. But they've now scaled it down to have presence at the senatorial district level, 109. So what we, are, what we are saying is that if they have that asset, after all, if you do a SWOT analysis, there are two sides of it. The weak side and then the strong side, isn't it? There is opportunity as much as there is weaknesses, isn't it? There is threat 
eh, as much as there is also strength. So you deploy your areas of strength and your opportunities, match them together, and then lessen your weakness, and you can now face the threat that you are seeing. It's a simple, you know, strategic, uh, you know, uh, way of doing things. So I believe the bank is being repositioned, and alongside with some of the changes we are witnessing from the CBN, they have the NILSAL, they have the NILSAL Microfinance Bank. All of those things, as much as possible, are under their influence. So how can you be a jury in your own case? So I think a lot of discussion is ongoing now, so I cannot tell you exactly but I know the intentment is to strengthen our institutional ecosystem to enable people to do the next thing they want to do. Now, in terms of support, I'm happy the farmer has realized all countries provide support. In billions, in billions, massive support. Well, you say subsidy here, they call it support. So it's a matter of name. So if, if, if using the word subsidy is a problem, please, for us in the Federal Ministry of Agriculture and Food Security, we have banished subsidy in our names. What we are dealing is providing support. There could be technical support, okay? There could be infrastructural support. There could be advisory extension support. Support is support. What it means is that the farmers need to be aided to achieve the maximum productivity that they need. And I'll also tell you for a fact that having analyzed what we met on ground last year, we came up with our focal areas. And we realized it is important that we recognize the value of our smallholder farming. But we can also do with supporting those who have massively invested in different farming operations across the country who needs one or two support from government but are not getting it. This year, we intend to start a program that will highlight who these people are, where they are located, what operations they do, so that we can key them in as verified, genuine farmers. Not the portfolio farmers, not the political farmers, not the fake farmers, who come in with tens and thousands of hectares claim just to siphon whatever support government is making available to farmers. And at the end of the day, on paper, we are supposed to have massive production, but in reality, there is nothing to show for it. This has been part of the problems we met. And the good news also here is that, based on our engagement with the subnationals, Almost all the state governors that we have interacted with, and I think at the last count about 17 of them that have visited us and we've had engagement with them, have agreed with us that it's time for us to banish and do away with anybody who is not genuinely a farmer, who wants to come and tap into what is being provided for farmers who want to genuinely work. That is a massive paradigm shift because the reality is hitting us back. Now, the other aspect is, in terms of what we need to do to make agriculture a business, I will tell you from 2011, the Federal Minister of Agriculture under the then minister, who is now the president of African Development Bank, has actually come out with that policy imperative. And arising from that, that is why we are having you know, a Federal Department of Agribusiness Development in the Federal Ministry of Agriculture and Food Security. Now, what is important here is in terms of what needs to be done. And I think here we are actually looking at this department in terms of what they are doing. And we are looking at how to bring the youth to be involved in enterprise development in the agricultural sector. From mechanization, for example, where we have mechanization enterprises to processing. And I'm happy she has mentioned you know, that as a key gap. Because the problem we are having is that you take cassava, for example. Nigeria's production figure currently is about 63 million metric tons, which is the largest globally. 
So Nigeria is the number one cassava producer. But when it comes to value added and revenue from what you produce, if you check the statistics today, Nigeria's figure is so infinitesimal that the bar chart will not even capture it. But who are the countries taking it? Thailand. And their production is not even up to half of our volume. But what they produce, they massively add value and turn it into so many things which finds its way back into this country. Is that not? There is a particular drink. I can't remember the name. It just is in, you know, they put it in glasses. But you think it's like milk. I've forgotten the name. It comes white or with uh, coffee. What was that uh, drink we used to know? You know now. It's just a drink. I've forgotten the name. Um, if I say it, all of you will know it. Honestly, it's coming from Thailand. It's a product of Thailand, but it's coming from cassava. Mm -mm. Maybe you will remember the name. So, the point I'm saying is this. If you check the total trade figure for cassava, 80% of it is being gotten by Thailand. It's all about the value proposition, what they are able to make out of it. So all these commodities that we're talking about, we need to look at how to add value. And that is one of the areas our ministry is looking at. Because we also realize the entry point here is that we are having 40, 50, some even more than that percentage post-harvest losses in many of these commodities. So, if you can reduce, even if it's by 10%, the post-harvest losses in what we produce, the value into our economy is not small. And that is where the challenge is. But you see, it's also easy to criticize governments or leaders. We need to find a way to voice out the need for a paradigm shift by our youth also. Why am I saying so? As a senator of the Federal Republic, the privilege of attracting this so-called constituency project that people bash and bash and bash us to my senatorial district, I recognize the need to provide some of this kind of intervention. But what happened? Thanks for checking out Symphony on YouTube. Please be sure to subscribe and like our videos for updates.